Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototopus Mystery. This will be part 277 in our series. Our title today is Return of the Kings. Now we want to take a look at the significance of events that are going to take place in the immediate future and how mankind fits in this picture. So having said that, we, <clears throat> we want to um, pursue a little bit the first principle here. Scripture teaches the Bible is a chronicle of the lower heavens and the earth before the advent of Adamic man on the earth. <clears throat> what is taught is that man, Adamic man, is uh, the most uh, central figure of the Bible. The Adamic man is basically a dominant race in the creation. When you study the scripture, you will find that it is diametrically the opposite. The Bible does not present Adamic man as being significant and being a potentially centerpiece of the creation. Turn to uh, Genesis, the second chapter, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth. Now this goes immediately starts off giving us an understanding of intelligence, of <clears throat> beings that exist in the heavens and in the earth. Title generations. So the scripture is letting us know that the Bible here is a chronicle of the generations, the races, the life forms that were created in the heavens and in the earth. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So what you have here are two creations that are being presented. In one, it's called <coughs> the heavens and the earth, <coughs> which is a separate creation from the earth and the heavens. <coughs> man, Adamic man, comes into being in the time of the creation of the earth and the heavens. This is what the Bible is presented. <clears throat> the Bible presents itself as a chronicle of the generations of the heavens and of the earth. Man comes into being when the earth, the day that the earth and the heavens were brought into being. We have two separate creations, yes. Okay, I wanted to bring that out. Because see, one, he's talking about these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Mm -hmm. Then it says, in the day that the Lord made. So it was created and then made. And we know there's a de vast difference between the one. The created is a spiritual, the made is a physical. Yes. In uh, man, the human race doesn't come into being until the advent of the secondary creation, the earth and the heavens, and the events that took place in them. Man basically is a latecomer even in that creation. Let's go on. Scripture teaches the earth 
in the heavens, this, we call it the secondary creation, were dominated by the water element, which caused all things to flourish. Turn to Psalms 148, verse 4. Praise Him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. So, this creation was dominated by the water element. Turn to 2 Peter, 3rd chapter, verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, <coughs> that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So long before the advent of Adamic man, it's giving us the understanding of the environment in which the other races flourished. They flourished in a water environment. Help us understand this standing out of the water and in the water, one presumes at the same time. It's referring to density, it's referring to composition. Water element can be an ex experienced, I'll put it that way, mm -hmm. in different characteristics of density levels. So that would be the standing out of. Okay. Yes. And I, Therefore, we understand that the in the water means that in whatever form the water still is, it surrounds the earth in some way. Yes, it's talking about the totality of the earth mm. surrounded by water. It's also talking about water was the element in which life was driven, in which life manifested, in which life functioned. It's talking about at this time, the earth was radically different from the time in which human beings came on the scene. Should we understand this to imply the hidden above in the firmament and the hidden beneath? For example, the sea princes come from the hidden beneath. Mm -hmm. The Harlot City operates in the hidden Yeah, but that's, that, that's different. Oh, that, that's what I'm trying yeah, to understand. That's okay. different. This is referring to the natural, not the hidden. Everything will function in this way. What did that was the dynamic through which everything functioned. Now turn to Genesis second chapter, verse seven. <coughs> And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Nephesh in the Hebrew. Man is not composed in any sign or way dealing with the water element. Man is a creature of the earth element. Totally composed of matter, Eretz. In this particular capacity, low grade form of Eretz. <laughs> So man makes his advent long after things have taken place in the former creation. So we want. The Lord 
Y-H-P-H. Y-H-P-H. <coughs> so what we want to take a look at here is putting everything in its proper perspective. Because the Bible gives us a succinct, succinct progression of events for a purpose, for a reason. But the way it's taught, of course, um, deviates dramatically from that. They lump everything together and uh, they miss the stages of activities that have been taking place. You say, well, why are you talking about all this? Because we want to take a look at the significance of these beings we call the kings. Why it is that they're going to return and what happens before they were on the scene. The kings are <coughs> immortals who are part and parcel of the first creation, the creation that was spoken into being. They're immortal, they don't die, they're angelic beings who have the ability to inhabit the heavens and the earth realm. They can manifest in either stage that they desire. What we find, God, the Father, Elohim, gave them sovereign positions of rulership over the secondary creation. In this, their responsibility was to run the creation, their responsibility was to develop the life forms called in the Bible the nations, which are groups of lesser intelligences that are native to the secondary creation. The kings were given dominion over the secondary creation to develop it and to bring it to fruition according to the plan of Elohim. Now, having said that, what we find, <coughs> turn to Ezekiel, 31st chapter. Here you have a, a brief picture of <coughs> that time and the events that were taking place at that time. <clears throat> the realm, the region, the creation was called Lebanon. Which, well, actually it means White Mountain. In this respect, these beings were given a status, a society in which they operated They were given rulership, estates, divisions over this whole creation. <clears throat> each king had a responsibility, each king had an estate, each king was a ruler, a sovereign, <clears throat> given dominion over a specific place in which the father placed him and in which the father gave him authority. Yes, sir. Okay. Does in my father's house house are many mansions? Does that apply to what you just now said? That's it. Yeah. That's it. <clears throat> we find as events progressed, one individual who is a race of angels called cherubim stood out. He was created to be a dominant figure. He was created to be ultimately a director over the entire creation. 
His name was Lucifer. He ultimately developed his full potential and he engaged in faithfully carrying out his responsibilities. Gen uh, Ezekiel, the 31st chapter, verse 6, gives you a picture of him at his zenith. All of the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs. Under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young. And under his shadow dwelt all great nations. Now this is symbolic <coughs> terminology picturing him as a great overflowing tree. It's giving us the understanding of his <coughs> influence over the entirety of the creation. Ultimately, as we all know, he became corrupted and he fell. This is where we want to pick it up. When he fell, yes. I know you're going to make me feel like an idiot, but here we go. What kind of tree is Lucifer? Cedar. Cedar, yeah. Cedar of Lebanon. Yes. When he fell, the scripture is giving us an understanding of the tremendous upheaval that transpired as a result of his fall. He corrupted not only the creation, he corrupted the other rulers that were with him. This is where we want to start picking it up. Ezekiel 31 verses 16 to 17. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall. The nations were the life forms of the creation that these kings had rulership over. The whole creation shook as a result of his fall. When I cast him down to hell, with them that descend into the pit, and all the trees of Eden, the choice and the best of Lebanon, talking about the rulership groups, all that drink water shall be comforted in the neither parts of the earth. So they all were cast down to the subterranean regions of earth. I want you to picture this in your mind. The subterranean regions became the abode of all these rulers, whether they had been loyal or whether they had been part of the rebellion, they were all cast down to this region. Now having said that, this is where the Bible comes in at the time of the fall. Turn to Genesis, the first chapter. Verses 1 to 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And this is giving you <coughs> the chronological order of events. The heaven and the earth are created. That's Genesis, the fourth chapter. The earth and the heavens, the secondary creation, becomes corrupted. In the scripture, it's called the earth. Verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This is the fall of Lucifer. This is the fall of his followers called the kings of the earth. They are now in rebellion. They are now cast down to the neither regions of hell. 
Genesis, the first chapter, goes on to give a, a chronicle, an account of what we call a recreation. We won't go into that now because it'll be too confusing. What we want to focus on is what happened to the individuals that were cast down from the original creation. Well, they're still down there. What happens? Man, human beings, come on the scene at this point. Genesis, the second chapter. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. The human race doesn't come on the scene until after the fall, after the totality of everything is transpired. Man comes on the scene for what purpose? As a custodian over the earth. Read it for yourself. Genesis, the second chapter. Verse 5. To seven. Every plant of the field before it was in the earth, every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man. The word man is Adam. There was not an Adam to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And then the Lord God makes an Adam. Adam was brought forth to be a custodian of the earth. Then he takes him and he <clears throat> makes this tremendous beautiful garden and he puts man in that to be a custodian over that and then that's where the fall takes place. Yes. Why does he say it in the fashion as if it's a matter of fact the man tills the soil. But there isn't a man to till this soil. So obviously the, the, the precedence has, has, has been in, in motion in another realm, in the spiritual realm? Yes. Yeah. Where, where Adam was tilling the soil? Well, he was a custodian of the earth. In the spiritual realm, you don't till the soil, but in the physical, that's what you would do. The word Adam means basically a soil tiller. It's distinct from all the other translations of man which don't refer to an atom. An atom is always connected to the earth. Man, <coughs> in the Hebrew is ish, is what <coughs> are described as angels. Angels are called men. An angel is always called an ish. He's never called an Adam. Here you have the distinction of the races. Adam is always connected to the soil. Ish is far removed from the soil. Ish are angelic beings, and even kings are called Ish, have dominion over the heavens. Yes. So Adam's purpose <clears throat> to till the soil, was that to provide food? No, everything was in the service of YHVH. <clears throat> he was to be a an individual who was to bring forth lesser life forms in the service of YHVH. We just read every tree, every herb, everything was in the earth, in the subterranean. YHVH designed the soil to bring forth things from the subterranean <coughs> to decorate the surface world. He didn't have an atom to do it. He had a choice. He could make it rain or he could put a man on, that a soil tiller, on the scene to bring it forth. He chose the latter. Yes. And bring it forth in YHVH's design and, and yes. desire. Yes, everything so was... So Adam isn't just, you know, bling bang and, you know, creating trees and this and that. He has a director in Lucifer, or YHVH. Yes, that was the purpose of YHVH's bringing him forth. It wasn't for him. It was for the service of YHVH. He had a plan that he was putting in operation. 
This was one part of the plan. The garden setting was another part of the plan. <clears throat> he took the man from the place where he was brought forth to be a custodian over the garden, which was a, a next, next phase of his plan. But because of the fall, his plan never went to fruition because the human race blew it and brought in a whole new scenario of things that took place. You know what, brother, I take a little offense at that. Mm. The human race blew it. Yes. Well, Adam blew it, and I get blamed for it. <laughs> so. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So very briefly, the Adam, the spiritual Adam I'm talking about, who did not till the soil, mm. what did he do? He's a custodian over the spiritual earth. If he didn't till, what did he do? He brought forth things that embellished what he had been put in charge of. By calling them? Sure. Hmm. Sure. He had uh, abilities in the spiritual realm to do things that were greatly lessened in the physical realm. physical realm is a region of limitation, sure, that's right. which he didn't have where he was originally. He's in the spiritual realm. <clears throat> but that's just, this is just pre preliminary. To give you an understanding of where we're going here. So we find that the kings of the earth are relegated to, <clears throat> because of rebellion, confined to the neither regions of earth. Now, scripture tells us <clears throat> at the beginning of sorrows, these kings will again begin to be released to reestablish their kingdoms on the earth's surface. Turn to Daniel, the seventh chapter, verse 17. Daniel, the seventh chapter, verse 17. Man is going to be disqualified from being a custodian of the earth, and the mandate is going to return back to the original kings. Yes. Well, we be tested during the gathering session. No. Okay, so that section that session has already happened yeah. for us. Okay. Daniel seven. Verse 17. Daniel has a vision which he receives revelation of the significance of it in verse 17. <clears throat> These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. What will happen at the beginning of sorrows is a progression of these ancient kings coming from confinement back to the surface of the earth. You find this consistently. Daniel 7 verse 24. And the ten horns out of the kingdom, out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. Where are they going to rise from? Out of the earth. And another shall rise after them. <clears throat> Where is he going to rise from? Out of the earth. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. You're going to have a series of these kings being brought back to dominate the surface world again. Turn to Revelation. 13th chapter, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. These beings are going to dominate 
the landscape. <clears throat> it goes on and on and on and on. They are going to dominate the earth. The human race is going to become a vassal to them. Turn back to Daniel. Just before you turn, are the majority of these German? Yes. Okay. Like what kind of They're the leaders of uh, the original Luciferian order. What kind of proportions are we talking about? 80%, 90% German? I'd say probably uh, in the vicinity of about 90% because they're called the Cedars of Lebanon. Okay. Turn back to Daniel. So they're all going to be walking around with four heads. Second chapter, no. Hmm. No. Oh. They won't need that life on earth. They need that beyond the earth. How will they look? Well, they shape shift depending on what they need to oh, do. Okay, okay. Here we go. Daniel, second chapter. Verse uh, 43 to 44. <laughs> and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Where men there is Adam. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. And in the days of these kings, so the ones that are mingling with <coughs> the seed of men are the ancient kings that had been imprisoned in the neither regions of the earth. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. <clears throat> so, we want to establish something here. These kings are going to establish kingdoms. And the kingdoms that they're going to establish are going to stamp flat the, Lucif the uh, Adamic order. <clears throat> Turn to Daniel, the seventh chapter. Verse 23. <clears throat> Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms. Why? Because it's not going to be a kingdom of humans. And shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. So this... When these kings surface, they're going to reestablish their kingdoms and at the expense of the human order, they are going to dominate the earth, both the surface world and the subterranean world. The human race is going to become a vassal race of servants under the dominion of these kings. Now, what will they bring with them? They're going to bring idolatry. They're going to bring worship of gods, because that's what they are. They are gods. We see this in several passages of Scripture. Scripture teaches the coming judgment will disqualify Damic man from custody of the earth and give it to the Luciferian kings to reestablish their kingdoms. <clears throat> we see this, turn to Ezekiel, the seventh chapter, verse 20 to 21. Seven, 20, 21? Yes.
As for the beauty of his ornament, he said it in majesty. He's talking about the earth. But they, the human race, made the images of their abominations and of the detestable things therein. Therefore have I set it far from them. And I will give it into the hands of the strangers for a prey, and to the wicked of the earth for a spoil, and they shall pollute it. The strangers are the kings, the wicked are the races of darkness. They are currently roaming different areas and uh, causing a lot of uh, disruptions. You're talking about creatures like Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Mothman. So we're not talking about demons? Well, they're considered demons in the sense of being in a physical realm, physical environment. They're demonic creatures. They see you, they'll tear you apart. Mm -hmm. They're evil, vicious. That's why he calls them the evil of the, of the earth. They, like the Luciferian kings, were confined. They were part of the fallen creation. Well now, along with the Luciferian kings, they're going to be established to dominate the surface world again. Is that when the Lord releases the, the vials? No, that's before. The vials are released as a judgment on them. Turn to <coughs> Jeremiah 25, verse 26. This is a picture of the fall of the human order. <clears throat> in all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, in all the kingdoms of the world which are upon the face of the earth, in the king of Sishak, which is uh, the Luciferian kingdom shall drink after them. So first the human race, the human order is going to fall. The Shishak kingdoms are going to replace it. And then they're going to be destroyed at the establishment of God's kingdom. Of which the Prototokos are going to be given dominion over the earth. Let's see if we can uh, take a look at some more principles dealing with this. I know this is not the easiest thing to follow, but this is what the Bible is telling us is going to happen. Scripture teaches, by the time of the tribulation period, the earth will be totally under the rule of the Luciferian God Kings. Every member of the human race who is not born again, does not have the spirit in him, is going to be under the influence of some God. Hmm. Turn to Daniel, the 11th chapter, verse 36 to 39. <clears throat> this is talking about the time of the rise of the beast formerly the Antichrist. And the king, talking about the beast, shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. And shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. Talking about the father and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate, his headquarters, shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not 
shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them, these gods, to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. The human race is going to be under the dominion of the gods. And they are going to dominate the thinking of man, the activities of man, the total life of man. Yes. Okay. It seems that the Antichrist beast is dominating the rest of these beasts and is assigning them their responsibilities. He's not dominating them. He's um, rewarding them. You got the force guide, you got these other guys, they've given him power to do what he's doing. So he's giving them a reward for their efforts, if you will. Acknowledging them. He's not sub submiss uh, submissive in the sense of <coughs> being uh, ruled over them. He's sharing rulership with them over the earth. Oh, precisely. That's the reason I see Father. He, he's, he wants to be proclaimed the God of gods. Mm -hmm. So he wants to have the doubt. You can go worship all these other gods, but you put me first. Right. But he's being a little bit tolerant, lenient, and rewarding these guys, not saying I'm the Lord, God of gods. Because this is a, is in a circle that's given him the power to dominate all the other gods. And in that respect, <coughs> notice it says, in the most strongholds. So this is done, being done in his fortress in secrecy. Right. He's got this little cadre around him that have enabled him, you know, it's just politics. Mm -hmm enable him to have the position that he has. He says, okay, you're going to get this, you're going to get that, you're going to get the other. I acknowledge you as, you know, being this, being that. This is the true aspect. The rest of it is a deception. Yes. But he's presented himself as some kind of a force to be reckoned with, and everybody, every god is going to have to acknowledge him because it's an image, it's a kind job. Yeah, just for the humans. Yes. Because mm. we know the god of forces is clearly... Far more He's in charge. Than him. Yes. Yeah. So what we find here now, what we find is the father is pulling back the curtain, giving us an understanding of the things that are going to take place on the earth. What we find the father has also spoken a judgment on these gods. Turn to <clears throat> scripture teaches. The conflicts of the latter part of the tribulation period will be against these Luciferian gods and the humans who have aligned themselves with them. Jeremiah 10th chapter, verse 11. Thus shall you say unto them, The gods that have not made the heavens. Now the word made there comes from a Hebrew term, bad, B-A-D. It means <coughs> kept. It means to perform activity. So what he's saying here, the gods that have mishandled, not performed the way that they should have the heavens and the earth even they <coughs> shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens he's brought a judgment upon them <coughs> turn to Psalms 82 verse 6 to 7 
I have said your gods, and all of you are the children of the Most High. So these are the high angelic principalities <coughs> that are in some cases called sons of God. Other cases there's thrones, dominions, principalities, dawn stars. Well, not dawn stars, but <coughs> the angelic beings that fell with Lucifer. And basically, didn't fall with Lucifer. They fell after Lucifer because the ones that fell with Lucifer are still in prison. This group is currently in the heavens doing their damage, doing their dirt. But they're called gods. Yes. The sons of God that we're reading about here. Yeah. And the sons of God that we are. Is it the same word, sons? Same word, but it's not the same group. One servant, one son. These are angelic beings. They're servants. But they're called sons of God. Son means... Builder? A builder, yes. <clears throat> In this instance. Yes. Mm. In that respect, it's what they do. They administer the creation. But they called Bene. Bene, uh, ben is a son in a sense of um, builder or relative. Curious, but not son of God. Well, these are called sons of the Most High. I'm asking you do, you, do you use the term Ben or Bene for the Prototokos? Yes. Right. Yes. The word, same word. Okay. But it is applied to do different groups. Yes. Does that same word when it's in capitals versus I lowercase mean the same thing? The uh, word capital son? Yeah. It usually refers to the Lord. Mono the monogenesis, the only begotten son. So, okay, so there is a difference between the capital S O N and these sons that we're talking about. It's a different word. No, it's the same word, but it's emphasizing one unique individual. That's why it's capitalized. Mm -hmm. Men are called sons. Um, the sons of um, Seth. The sons of God came in to the daughters of men. So I was talking about the line of um, chosen to have the image of God. So it depends on the context of the scripture. It depends on what's being referred to, but it's the same word. Now, what's being said here, let's go on. Verse 6, I have said, You are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men. The word men near is Adam. And shall fall like one of the princes. So they're going to come under a judgment. Just like the human race comes under a judgment. <clears throat> Turn to Zephaniah, 2nd chapter, verse 11. Zephaniah 2nd chapter, verse 11. The Lord shall be terrible unto them, for he shall famish. That means to drain, to um, weaken, take away their energy. He shall famish all the gods of the earth, and men shall worship him, everyone from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. So he's pronouncing judgment against these individuals. They're going to take up residence <coughs> on the earth at the time of the beginning of Solos. At the point of famishing, why are the heathen referred to as living in isles? Because you're going to have... The word isles there means basically large continents. Remember, they divide the earth. Okay. They take up dominion. They set up their kingdoms. <coughs> the earth is not going to look the way then that it does now because it's going to be sectioned by them. You're going to have tremendous upheavals, 
You're going to have land masses coming up to the surface that currently are not there now. Other land masses going below that <clears throat> currently are on the surface. They're going to terraform the Earth to their own design. So each region or territory is, is referred to as an island. <clears throat> yes, <clears throat> or it can be referred to as a a design for the kingdom of the individual that's running it. Yes. So there will be more water than land. Most definitely. Yeah. And Most definitely. who are the heathens? Who are the heathen? Is it more than land? Well, it depends on where the, which is the scripture you're referring to. The Isles of the Heathen? Oh, okay. <clears throat> that's talking about basically the... the uh, the life forms that the kings are ruling over. The word heathen connotes any group that's not of Israel. They use the word goi, meaning Gentile. They use the word heathen, meaning non-Jew. But this is referring to Luciferian life forms that are under the dominion of the gods. Nations. Yes. Right. So not the gods themselves, the nations. The nations them. that right. are dominated by these particular kings. Gotcha. So the earth is going to be tremendously shifted from what it is now. Remember, the earth is not a planet. It's a matrix. The human race has defined it, put it in a box, and organized religion has made it even more of a uh, uh, distortion than what the Bible presents it to be. <clears throat> the earth is basically a residence for many races. The human race is only one of many races that comprise this matrix system. Turn to Revelation, fifth chapter. You see several different places the uh, uh, references to <coughs> abodes that are not dominated by Adamic man. Revelation, the fifth chapter. Verses 2 to 3. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. It's talking about the races that inhabit the heavens, the surface world, and the subterranean, of which there are multitudes. What you have, and what will happen, all these things, all is going to change after the beginning of sorrows. I can't repeat this enough. Man is going to see that the reality he thought he knew was a a, a, a a total fabrication when these things become pre, pre, uh, predominant and they dominate the landscape man's thinking the human race isn't going to have any way to deal with it because it's not going to be prepared for it only those who are committed to the Lord and open to the Holy Spirit's revelation will see it for what it is turn to, Revel uh, turn to uh, Luke 21st chapter Twenty-six. Okay. 
men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken people are going to be dropping dead because of fright because of the revelations of things that they're going to see that they never believed existed and if you told them today you'd be ridiculed and laughed at but the same individuals that are ridiculing and laughing at are going to be wiping out when they see these things happening that's the thinking of the human race <coughs> Man is going to be so dominated <coughs> by the gods and worshipping non-humans that there's nothing, once he starts down that path, even God will not be able to change him. Turn to Revelation 9th chapter. Verse 20. <clears throat> and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk. So it's talking about man is going to be so caught up in these things, he's going to worship non-human intelligences and representations of non-human intelligences that are not sentient whatsoever. He's not going to be able to pull himself away from worshiping these intelligences. What keeps the foolish virgins? from um, getting sucked into worship of the kings. The Holy Spirit. Commitment to the, to the bridegroom. So they're 100% committed? Sure. Just having the commitment to never study. flags. Mm. It's just their ability to bring to fruition what they're desiring to do because of their own... Lack of understanding. Uh, turn to Deuteronomy. 32nd chapter. Man is going to worship these gods. The Bible talks about this from one end of the scripture to the other. Deuteronomy 32, <clears throat> verses 16 <coughs> to 17. <coughs> 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 they provoked him, YHVH, to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God to gods whom they knew not, to new gods they came newly up. They came up from the subterranean region, made contact with these Israelites, and totally took them away from the worship of YHVH. <clears throat> to new gods they came newly up whom your fathers feared not. The world, the earth is going to be overrun by these beings. The human race is going to be at a, a loss uh, as how to deal with, they're going to be so overwhelmed that they're just going to fall under their influence and that's it. Case in point, where is this leading? Turn to Revelation, the 13th chapter. And we'll close with this.
It's only verse 6 and 7. And he opened his mouth to blaspheme against God, and to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth, I'm going to repeat that, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All human race, with the exception of those whose names are written in the book of life, in other words, they have the Spirit dwelling them, are going to worship the gods. The whole human race, with the exception of those that have the Spirit, are going to worship Him as the head God. You just read it. This is where this is leading. People don't believe. And they laugh and they scorn. But they had better seek for themselves because this isn't going to go away. This is going to be the reality that people have to deal with. And they're going to be ready for it. This is talking about the whole human race. Is that an actual beast? No, he's a man. He's a man. He's he is a god who incarnates into the body of a man and is filled with power to the point where he deceives the whole human race. He's a Luciferian king. Okay, okay. One of the ancient Luciferian kings that ruled the earth with Lucifer before the revolt. He gets imprisoned in the heart of the earth. He is released. He comes back. And he ultimately dominates the whole human race. He's the one that, that, that crafts 666, where everybody takes the mark. This is the beast that they take the mark from, showing that they're loyally to him, that they worship him, and they consider him their God. 